comes the <laughs> music now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be very cool. This panel has never been done before at any coding convention. Oh my god. <laughs> Um, I'm just kind of vamping while they get everything set up. <laughs> Larson agreed to do this, actually, of his own volition. So, I got yourself into this, buddy. I, I forced my way onto this stage. <laughs> I'm going to moderate your panel. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> um, I'm Emmanuel Larson. I'm a writer for the show, My Little Pony. This guy is called Stephen Andrews, and he is responsible for so much of the music on the show that you love. Um, yeah! He's yeah. going to show you today this unbelievable stuff about how it all comes to me. And he's going to, uh, you're going to hear some stuff. Yes. That's exactly what should happen. All right. Got a video hooked up. Do we have contact? I'll just tell you a little bit about him. He's 17 years old. <laughs> Taiwan. He's been doing music for about two weeks. <laughs> he can fly. When's his mixtape coming out? Not yet, but you're going to make that happen, right? <laughs> you have a mixtape coming out? <laughs> we don't do mixtapes anymore, Mitch. <laughs> He's got a playlist coming out. He's a boy. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to get everything up and running here. I brought with me some of the software that I actually use to write music and to orchestrate songs and to assemble stuff for delivery for the final uh, final production of uh, television shows, not the least of which, Pilot and Honey. And uh, I wanted to show a little bit, play a little bit of music, play some clips, and show uh, sort of how it goes into the can, into the box, and how it gets open together. In all seriousness, I'm going to tell you your credits, even though I'll probably get them wrong. He did all of the background music for two episodes of Magical Mystery Cure and Keep Ride. Woo! Yeah! Is that right? Most of it, yeah. Most of it. It's, it's shared with my beloved partner, Daniel Ingram. You know Daniel, right? Yes! Yeah. 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 Me and Daniel, actually, I got a photo of, uh, well, my half of the studio, anyways, in the DHX building in Vancouver. Um, me and him have actually co leased our own space, our own studio space just to be within the umbrella, to be, uh, you know, on site. So it's been pretty cool. He also wrote the theme for Star Wars. <laughs> Jaws, yeah. Jurassic Park, right? No, I think you were reading my dream journal again. <laughs> Thank you. 
orchestrate and you know add instruments to it and that's part of what I wanted to show today and just so people can see what that looks like and sounds like and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Can I ask you just about the flow of an episode? So we write yeah. it, voice actors record it, goes to animation, at what stage do you get it? Yeah, I mean uh, it's kind of straightforward although I always trip over myself whenever I try to explain it. Um, so at the script stage, like there's kind of two parts of the music when it comes to pretty much any animated TV series, uh, especially Pony. We're at the script stage. That's when the songs have to get written. So Daniel gets brought in very early, and that could be that's super early. That's like a year before broadcast, right? Um, and so the script gets written, and he has to write the song, but he writes it as kind of a sketch, like an you know, artist will sketch. And then, you know, like in the animation department, they go back in and they shade it out and color it in between it and all that kind of stuff. It's sort of the same kind of thing can happen in music because, you know, there's an episode every week and there's a lot of work to do. Um, so what happens is the song has to get written and it gets written uh, and placed in the show because they've got to do the animatic. You know, they've got to dummy it up uh, for timing so that they know, okay, the song's this long, it's going to fit this way, uh, you know. So that can sit like that for a while. And then the song gets produced, so it gets the full treatment. It gets, you know, the guitars and uh, all the stuff recorded into it, and it gets the instruments added, whether they're live recorded or they're digitally produced, but still sound very good, because the sample libraries and stuff, are, they're really smashing, they're fantastic. Um, where the vocals come in for the songs, um, the vocals get a temp, like uh, an early record, just to get them placed into the song. But very, very early, um, before that happens, usually Daniel ends up singing the songs, and uh, his voice ends up going on, because he's got to get the song approved by the producers and by Hasbro. And then they say, okay, go and record it with the singers, because you know, don't want to be going back and forth and redoing everything uh, all over the time. So um, that can happen, the production for the songs can happen. Uh, any time between like a year out to closer to the date of the actual broadcast of the show. However, the other half of the formula is, uh, wow, the dark. That is so much better. It's getting so somber in here. Uh, is my face like eerily lit by the laptop screen? <laughs> Giggle at the ghost. <laughs> this is great because all the light is on you guys. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, what I was saying is um, the background music for the show, which is huge, because there might be a song in an episode, there might not be. There might be a song, there might be no songs in an episode. Um, the background music actually is considered post production, so it happens at the very, very end. And there's kind of several separate things that happen independently at the same time and then all come together at the end. So the dialogue for the show, right, gets recorded uh, early on, but then they go in for ADR pickups, which is they replace lines, and they tweak it, and they get the form performance just right. Um, and then the sound effects are added, but that's done by Dick and Rogers, which is the, the studio, the big sound studio that is on the same floor. It's in the same building. Um, and they do that for lots of television shows. So we don't do, we don't have anything to do with the sound effects. In fact, we don't even hear them until the very, very end, after all the music's done. So sometimes it's kind of hard to know. You know, you can see, oh, there's going to be a crash there, and there's going to be a crackle there, and there's going to be an explosion or a rain boom there or something. Um, you know, just willy nilly. <laughs> um, but they do an awesome job uh, over at Dick and Rogers, and they do the final mix down. So they take everything, and, you know, whether it's from Will or from us, we deliver to them, they get the sound effects, they have all the dialogue recording, and they we go and sit in a nice big theater with a mixing board, and we uh, watch the show, and they mix it all together to make sure that the dialogue's loud enough, and that the music is sitting where it should be, and the sound effects where they should be, and they meet the production requirements for delivering to broadcast, right, to iTunes and TV and all the rest, Netflix, goes on and on and on. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, um, just so you have an idea of how it all comes together. But in the microcosm, I could show you some of the stuff that happens when we're working on music. So 
should I open it up? I've got a few. Yeah, what do you got? What, what do they got? So what I've got is, um, so for the two big landmark episodes um, that uh, I've worked on, I'm super proud of, is uh, Magical Mystery Cure and Pinky Pride. And I brought with um, a file in a program called Pro Tools, which is for audio. You know, some people write music, but we don't really write music in it. We use it as a delivery tool. And you can see when I open it up here, everything's going to be kind of in, uh, in the session. So let me just stick that up here. Think about uh, open up Pinky Pride here. You guys seen Pinky Pride? Yeah. 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 That was so much fun to work on. I have to say, like, I think Daniel said this too, but the, the fact that we got to work with Will Al was so cool. I mean, I grew up listening to his music. I'm not that old. I'm not as old as you, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he's one of my childhood heroes because he got my sense of humor, and I just, I totally dig that. So when we had a chance to do this, it was fantastic. <laughs> Well, Bonus, looks like our work here is done. Okay, we have left off. All right, so this is Pro Tools, and what you can see is just the beginning of the episode here. Um, I've got the video floating here, and what we do is, you can see, if I show you the entire episode, um, what we have is music, like underscore tracks at the top, right here, these guys. And then songs are kind of on the tracks at the bottom here. And we split them out so we've got the bed track, which is like the instrumental, and the vocals are separate, so the mixers at the stage have the opportunity to change the levels just to meet standards and make sure everything is sounding good. And I can play some of this stuff for you so you can see uh, where it falls. These two top tracks here, these come from um, DHX, and they're basically the first pass of dialogue is the first track, and any temporary sound effects or music that needs to be synced to picture is on the second track, and that's stuff that they send us, so, uh, because this, you can see, right, this video is fully animated, it, there's some stuff, it's not totally final, right, it's the temporary uh, cut of the animation, but they've tempted in the songs so that they've been able to animate to them, right, to, for pacing and time. And, yeah, totally. I'm going to play this stuff. I just wanted to let people know what's going on. Um, and then what we do, right, is once everything's finally produced, we put in the final uh, stems, is what they're called. So all the tracks from a song, for example. You'll notice that there's a lot more tracks for songs than there might be for background music, like the stuff that's just up here. And that's because they don't require splits or stems or anything separate for that stuff, unless it's something that they might want to take out or move or change the volume of. So we have to make that determination when we send the music to the mix stage and then the directors and everybody are there making the final calls. It's just useful for them. Because they'll say like when, when the music gets uh, written or, or whatever, they'll say, oh, can you split that out so that we have some flexibility on that? We can't split everything because it would take forever. You know, so I'll play some of this stuff. Um, I wanted to just briefly mention, you'll see at the top is all these kind of markers here. So if I zoom in, what we do with music is before we even start, um, we sit down with the directors and we have a list, a spotting list is what it's called. We have a spot session. And you can see there's a list of markers here and they all have times on them in the video. And we just make brief notes on what the music should be doing. Um, so all that gets laid out as a blueprint, a roadmap. And then we're off to the races, and we do our thing, and we submit the final music for approval and for revision notes before it gets mixed out and, and done. And those notes show up along the timeline here at the top, if you zoom in. So as the playback is going by, you can see it really easily there. And uh, I think this says, what does it say here? Ho down source. So source is, means source music. That means it's like being played out of a speaker or being played by a band on the screen or something. So we've got the hoedown music going in the background and it fades in and then it fades out. And then you can see the spot marker says source fades to very distant and then transitions to score. And then we'll make more notes on a separate spreadsheet of what kind of music and stuff should go in here. And uh, usually this thing's absolutely littered with notes, but because there's so many songs, the songs don't have spot notes. But, uh, you know, it looks kind of clean and a big break there. 
So I'll play some of the stuff. And I'll just uh, play you some of the stems too, which is kind of fun. But Then I want to open up, I got to brought some files of the actual music. Because music isn't written in this program. This is just where the audio, these are all audio tracks. You can probably see it. Um, but you can switch them on and off and you can kind of play them. So I'll play some of the stuff. Start 
this very momentarily. The video sequencing uh, coming and going kind of trips out the uh, software. That's why they call it Pro Tools. <laughs> yeah, amateur tools. Gosh, who are you getting notes from along the way? Is it Hasbro and PHX? And it's actually combined. Yeah, it's the brain trust, right? And uh, you know, it's it's generally pretty good. You know, because sometimes we'll just be diving into something and you know, kind of go down the wrong path. I mean, it, it happens from time to time. Or sometimes they just have a different vision and you know, it changes. Let me see if I can get this up again. It's also new. So this 
spot notes here, without music, you can see, comes back in. The music pauses here, comes back in, continue thoughtful, right? And then a hold, the music kind of holds. And then it gets a little inspirational for Rainbow Dash. But I don't know if you heard the theme come back again in here, but we're going to hear it because we didn't just listen to it. So never mind. <laughs> so we'll listen to the music so you can see how that evolves. Right, the theme again. But more emotional. And then gets more pumping her up. Same thing. It becomes warm and resounding, right? So I mean, most of that was restating the melodic material from the song to keep it thematic. But it takes it in totally different, you know, paint strokes. And I'll just play it with the dialogue so you can hear that what that works. And tell the whole story, just the background. You get all the emotion. Oh yeah. In fact, I mean, maybe I'm just obsessive, but I'll buy soundtracks before seeing a movie or, or never seeing a movie and just listen to the soundtracks. But I have to do that, right? I mean, it's research. Cheese sandwich really is a super duper party planner, and you'll be a terrific headliner. I should have been a big enough pony to admit that and let you have your day. But don't you get it? You're both super duper party ponies. Sure, cheese sandwich is a great guest party pony. But your pony goes permanent party pony. No pony can ever take your place. And we could never have a party without you. Group hug time. Fun. Okay, so, and then Weird Al has this awesome song where they tell us his backstory. I uh, orchestrated uh, almost all of these songs. So the instrumental for these songs, uh, like the Goop Off song and Pinky's uh, and Weird Al's song here, um, I treated, I, I was brought in to help and add orchestra, like I like the background music there, but for the song. So the song already had music written, obviously. The underscore, I write myself, but the songs are written, right? And they have harmony and melody and they have everything in there. And then I assign them, orchestrate them, assign them to instruments for what is appropriate, right? If it's fully orchestral, then I'll flesh it out to make it sound. Sometimes it's a hybrid, right? And if it's a hybrid, um, like I wanted to open a, one of the song sessions, I'll show you. Uh, there's tracks of guitars and there's tracks of other stuff. And you've got some guys that help out, it's like uh, Dave Corman, Gil Chan, Trevor Hoffman, uh, that are super fantastic at playing instruments and they'll record the stuff in and it all comes together. All right, so I should open up. Just briefly here. Probably open up, uh, I brought the Goof Up song here. I'll, uh, let's cross our fingers and hope this works. I tried all this before I came, but you know. You just never know what's going to happen. The video's holding up, though. <laughs> Doesn't work. We never know the light show. <laughs> okay, so this is a different piece of software called Cubase. Um, guys use different stuff. There's Logic Pro. You know, some guys even use Pro Tools to write uh, and orchestrate and, and produce music. Um, I prefer Cubase. I like it a lot. Um, and this is what a typical kind of uh, session will look like. So this is the Goof Off song. And what is happening here is we've got some markers at the top. So I've made some notes of things that might need to be inserted or changed. I've got a whole track of chords. So what I like to do for reference is put the chords into the software so I can see them as I'm working with it. And so if you zoom in a bit here, you can see um, the first bar is the flat minor and then it goes to the flat minor over the flat. And so I've inserted all that for the whole song. Um, and what you're looking at here are tracks. So these are instruments here and I've sorted them out by section. So it starts with woodwinds, uh, you know, clarinets, flutes, uh, brass, trumpets, trombones and stuff. It goes to percussion instruments. Most of these are orchestral and then strings, you know, violins and stuff down here. And then this song had a lot of accordion, so I stuck in, you know, it's a recording track. Um, 
and then it's got some tracks. Uh, because this was kind of an odd one, <laughs> uh, I put in quacks and honks musically. <laughs> and so those were just audio files, right? This stuff's MIDI up here. These are instruments that are being uh, produced digitally, right? We really wish that we could use live orchestra. Where we can, we record, obviously, like I said, live instruments. And you're going to see that down at the bottom. So the Goof Off song had a bed, a base of instruments here. I can play those. Right, so you have drums, and you've got some synthesizer stuff going on. There's a mandolin and a bass guitar. So that lays the foundation, right? And all those are individually recorded as a banjo and stuff. It's pretty crazy. This song is, was so much, <laughs> so much fun to work on. Um, and then up here, I, it's like it's kind of a, it's kind of a klezmery kind of thing. So I got the clarinet doing noodly things. Uh, that is a musical term, by the way. <laughs> right. So that's happening in the background. There's a lot of stuff going on. The trading parts between seconds. I've got really big kind of wompy tuba and stuff. Kind of hard to hear, but it's, you know, it's actually, I chose that because it sounded kind of rough and kind of tumble and it worked really well in the song. Um, So there's your accordions and stuff, and I got the parts split out. I can't open these up very easily, unfortunately, but you can see that there's there's notes and stuff happening inside of there. It's it's not audio. The audio stuff is down here. Um, this stuff is all being produced, right? Note by note. So I should just play this as a play it together here. So it starts off in the show with a little bit of tension score, and then it jumps right into the song. So it's unusual, but that score is included here in this session. Usually, score and songs are in separate files. So it starts with a bit of that. I think 
these are yeah, these are spare audio files that I was working with. I had to go find sound effects to use. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I actually put them in. Where was it? Here, I'll, I'll make it louder so we can hear it, but... When we were done with quacks and honks, I was like, what sounds like a honk? What's funnier? <laughs> and then I just jumped the shark <laughs> with a ginormous fart. That's what happens. You start jumping, everything happens. Did anybody? Think? Here, I'll play you with the context. It's not this loud in the mix, but for the work. Did anybody know that was a thing? <laughs> this is my legacy. I think this was why someone gave me the fart gun, because it's not with me right now, because I've got them on the computer, the farts are in the computer, but... <laughs> so, that is, in a nutshell, how I uh, do my thing. Now, yeah, the farts don't go in everything, so don't start looking for them, they're not like Waldo, okay? They're not wearing funny hats. It's your calling card. So, um, We've got 15 minutes. I can take some questions, or I've got some other stuff that I can show. Yeah. Do we have any questions you want to line up here in the middle? The more far questions, the better. <laughs> <laughs> Did you sneak that past the directors and whatnot, or did they know that was in there? Well, it was in there, but no one said anything about it. <laughs> so I wasn't sure if they just didn't hear it, or if they liked it, but just didn't say anything about it. <laughs> they were just completely indifferent. Is that, you want this one, Cameron? Oh yeah, we got a mic. Or do you like 
have a little setup to record in your own sound. <laughs> oh yeah, I should have clarified that was not me. <laughs> or anybody that I know. What about the, what about the quacks? It was that you? The quacks? No. Those were from a sound effects library, so like a post-production sound effects library. They got tons of stuff. So the same stuff that like Dick and Rogers might use to, for the show itself. Um, it's, there's just no musical instruments out there that are easily available that have quacks or all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hey, uh, so you mentioned a little bit about how like you have to make some edits or you might be giving suggestions on how you can do the song needs to be. How would you describe like what amount of creative freedom you have for a piece of music does it change or how much can you get edited? Uh, how do you mean? Uh, like, how much control do you have over the song, or is it more directed by other people? Oh, for, for the songs? Yes. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's a largely collaboration, right? I mean, the script writers uh, collaborate with the producers and the directors, collaborate with, collaborates with Daniel, Daniel collaborates with me to produce it, uh, or a number of musicians who help contribute. Uh, you know, it's a team effort, right? And there's a fair bit of, there's a fair bit of uh, flexibility there, right? Because Everybody wants the best product for the show. Everybody's got ideas, but ultimately, you know, the the king idea comes out in the end. Have you ever used Fruity Loops at the studio? Yeah, I did actually, a long time ago. Um, believe it or not, I used to produce some electronic music, but uh, it's been years since I did that. Uh, okay. But yes, I have. I guess I also have a bit of a two-part question. The first part is. Um, when Daniel first writes the songs and makes the sketch, how does that sound when it comes to you? Is it basically just him on a guitar? Or is it him and a little keyboard part? How, how does he usually produce that? Well, I mean, Daniel, um, he puts in the stuff into a sequencer. Like, he'll use Logic Pro or something, and he'll workshop it. Okay. He'll, you know, he'll go through his process and plug it in. Because the thing is, when you're writing a song, you don't get mired down in, am I going to use a guitar? Am I going to do this and stuff? Right. It's kind of a stepped process. And it works the best that way. So if you can, he puts his mind in songwriting mode. He's putting in basically a piano to start. And he'll put in the chords and the melody as he's writing the lyrics and forming the lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then that will get the structure. Right? It's like when you're doing a sketch for something, you don't sketch an outline roughly and then start you know, doing detail on just the foot or whatever. I don't know what the analog is. But he gets the whole picture and he gets all the pertinent detail in there. And then that can be extruded. Right? It can be colored orchestrally or with instruments and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And what kind of orchestral libraries do you use and how much massaging does the MIDI need to sound pretty good? Uh, good question. I could talk for like days straight about that, but I can just say that uh, I use a lot of the stuff that's commonly available. I have tons of libraries. I've been doing this for a long time. I've collected lots, a lot of lots. Um, I like a lot of CineSample stuff, East West stuff, ADO stuff is cool. Uh, sample modeling is wicked, like clarinet and brass is uh, it's amazing. The stuff's not cheap, but you know, they're tools to do the job. and. I've kind of made it my passion because I come from a place where I love film music and I love the raw realism of instruments and I wish we could have real players play everything. But my object when I work on stuff like this, whether it's the underscore song production, is to get those instruments to sound as good as they can. Uh, so I, I massage them a lot. You know, I'll tweak them, I'll change the envelopes. I wasn't able to show you in that file there, but it's not just notes. There's um, <coughs> There's automation that's happening that controls the dynamics, the volume of, and the vibrato, and all sorts of stuff. Um, because these instruments are really, really, really impressive. They're very technically advanced. You can control lots of independent aspects of the instrument that way. So yes, I spent a lot of time on that too. Um, I was wondering, if you were to take any song or any sort of song from, well, any song really, and sort of make it goofier and put it in an MLP episode, what song would it really be? I mean, what song? Any song? Like, any song, in general. Like, if you could be or an artist, what song would you make goofy and put in an MLP episode? Make it goofy? Yeah. How, how goofy are we talking about? Are we talking farts goofy or just quiet? Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. 
I don't know, probably a Justin Bieber song. Because I think it might elevate it, I don't know. Done entirely in farts. Always expand your horizons. Cheers, you got a question? What did it take to become a composer and what kind of training did that need? Uh, fa fabulous question. Um, I can basically sum it up. Um, it's, it's a long kind of progression, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you gotta love what you do, you gotta love music. I love it from a very, very early age, listened to a ton of soundtracks, musicals, uh, and I educated myself that way through osmosis. Took piano lessons when I was young and quit at grade three. Uh, because I hated it and the piano teacher made me cry. <laughs> but everybody's different, right? Um, and so I can only kind of speak from my own experience. Um, I went the route of kind of teaching myself. And there's lots of guys in Hollywood, like Danny Elf kind of guys, who don't have a ton of formal musical education, but they've done all right, you know, and they're working on films and TV and stuff. Um, but it took a long time and a lot of patience. Uh, but I always just Write music, man. Um, just try new stuff. Don't don't just focus on one thing. Listen to lots of stuff. Write a lot of stuff, and just keep pursuing it. Try to score YouTube videos. You know, look for independent films. If you're really really gunning for it, you know, look for other composers where you are, or you might have to travel and work with them. Like I mentioned uh, at the BabsCon panel a few months ago, when me and Daniel were there, we both mentored under the same Composer. We apprenticed essentially, and it was so invaluable to do that. Um, and I would recommend doing that. Since starting as a professional arranger, uh, arranger for cartoons, do you ever do your own work, and do you find like the satisfaction for you as an arranger in these little five to ten second bits that you write for cartoons? Or do you, like, if you want to make, you know, a more epic 15-minute scoring, like, do you do that on your own time? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome question, too. Um, it gets to the point sometimes where there's so much work that you just don't have time to work on other stuff. But I absolutely love writing music. I don't do a lot of it, but I've been thinking about actually uh, writing, like, an album. Yeah. Of yeah. film, like film trailer kind of music, or uh, you know, Two Steps from Hell, Thomas Burgesson, Naughty Machine, that kind of stuff. If you don't know them, you gotta look them up because they're fantastic. Every movie trailer you've ever seen, uh, they're in there, <laughs> practically. But yeah, I mean, I mean, it comes from places. I started as a hobby, right, and then became a career when I just decided to go after it. Um, but I do try to sort of exact my revenge on the cartoons once in a while, <laughs> you know. And I say that tongue-in-cheek, but a lot of the time to listen to the cues that I write in scenes and they're way too dramatic or way too something, and I'm like, I want to write big, epic music, <laughs> and, you know. But that's the thing, is the creative freedom, right, uh, on these shows is pretty great. You know, on MLP, I also score a lot of the music on Little's Pad Shop, uh, Pound Puppies, and a bunch of other shows. And I do get a lot of satisfaction from that, absolutely. I absolutely love scoring the cartoons. <laughs> Um, so, what kind of music did you make back in your old FL Studio days, and can we find any of that anymore? <laughs> um, it's been so long. Um, I used a bunch of stuff. I actually used not just that, but Acid Pro, I think, from Sony. When it first came out, I like had a Sound Blaster AWE32 sound card. This is way back in the 90s. This is going back a ways. And I would play my own stuff, record my own loops, put it into kind of like Fat Boy Slim kind of stuff. I was like, yeah, hey, it's cool. I want to do that. <laughs> I was younger then. You know, I was younger. Um, I, you might, there's not much out there. I've done some video game music remixes on OC uh, Overclock Remix. I don't know. Oh, some what's, what's your name on there? Uh, my name. It's my name. <laughs> <laughs> Say my name. Google my name. Do whatever you want. But you'll probably find it. Uh, there's a handful of that's a fun fantasy six and seven remixes uh, the last few years, and that's just kind of like fun. It's just for fun. It's not for profit. I mean, it's again, it's someone else's music that I'm rearranging, but I just love the game, love the soundtracks. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering about the episode Fluttershy Hurricane when she's trying to become brave. 
I know the song Eye of the Tiger is fairly copyright and they try to charge a lot. How hard was it to make a parody to where nothing would happen to that song? How hard was it? Yeah, to make a spin-off. I wish I could say, because I didn't work on it. <laughs> um, that, was, that was Will Anderson. And he did a crazy job. Um, you'll have to, if you go to like, the Equestria LA, you can ask him, because he's going to be there. I have a question for you. You have a question? You're like an all-time go-to film score that you just yeah. love. Jurassic Park. What's that? Jurassic Park. Really? Yeah. I love Jurassic Park. Yeah. It's beautiful. I, there's no all-time. I, you know, I've got a collection of stuff that I love. Um, but that's the thing, right? Is you take little bits from everything that you love and you put them together, and that's kind of how I guess I found my sound. We're We're coming up 12 o'clock. We've hit noon. So thanks, Stefan, for all that awesome Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When, you go, when you go back and watch the show, you've got to listen really closely for farts and class. <laughs> thanks, everybody, for coming. It's awesome to see you. Thanks for the great questions.